Hello. Who is ready for a living word from the living God this morning? Well, that wasn't very loud. (laughs) So, by now, you will all hopefully recognize this picture, um, which represents uh, the elders' vision for 2022 and the focus areas that we wanted to focus on this year. You may remember that the boat itself represented the first part of the vision, which was that our heart as a a leadership would be that this year would be a year where each and every single one of us would grow in our love for the word of the Lord. And to put action to this focus area this year, um, we did a five-week series at the beginning of the year which was focused on providing context around the Bible as a book and how to go about about studying and reading it. Throughout the year, we have also been walking through the book of Matthew with the intention of studying this text together and developing united skills and unpacking a book for all that it's worth. The second focus area for the year was... Oh, good. Fellow elder knows it. Wonderful. Uh, Represented by the people in the boat going deeper with one another. And I shared from a literal boat in January about the importance of having people in your boat supporting you. And then Tara spoke about the importance of not isolating ourselves. We've championed connect groups. We've had a church family dinner with the pure intention of having a time where we have fellowship over food in our cafe space. And before we begin transitioning into our other two focus areas of being Holy Spirit led and gazing at the beauty of Christ, which there is some awesome stuff planned for, some awesome stuff planned for. The last three weeks have really sought to serve as a time to finish the teaching element of the going deeper focus area. And so Christine Harding, she spoke last week about questions that we can be asking uh, asking each other and those in our boat to have those deeper conversations. And two weeks ago, you may remember that I also spoke um, and did the first part of a two-part series um, from Ephesians 4, which was all about the importance of building each other up and using our words to encourage and to stir each other. And today, I am going to finish the going deeper part of the vision by talking into what I think is the most important thing that we all need if we are to have deep and lasting friendships with those directly in our boats, but also those in the wider church family as well. And before I share what that most important thing is, uh, we'll just pray for a bit, eh? So Lord, I just, I surrender this time to you. I surrender this time to you. And I'm so grateful that Um, you encountered and revealed yourself in such a beautiful and powerful way to Paul on that road to Damascus thousands of years ago. And I pray that the same spirit that inspired and gave him the words to put to these letters that we've been studying, I pray that that same spirit will speak and stir within each one of us today. May you reveal and stir within us what you would have us take And your mercy and grace, Lord, I pray for that. In the mighty name of Jesus, may you speak to us today as we explore your word together. Amen. So let's quickly refresh. Two weeks ago, we read Ephesians 4 together. And I spoke into the fact that following an incredible encounter with God on the road to Damascus, Paul turned from being someone who put people in prison to being a self-proclaimed prisoner for Jesus Christ. He was filled with the Spirit. He traveled doing ministry and building up the church. And he is believed to have written uh, the book of Ephesians when he was imprisoned in Rome for doing that very ministry. And this book, we discovered, was very intentional in its structure. 
Paul spends the first three chapters focusing on what Christ has done for us and what truths as Christians we believe. And last time I shared just some of those truths that Paul outlines, and I thought that I would read those again for us today so that we can receive them afresh and marvel at them afresh this morning. Now, I'm going to be a bit bold, um, but can I encourage you, can I encourage you that if you are willing and if you are able to stand as I read these truths out and to reach your hands in praise to Jesus, to actually um, invite the Spirit to stir these truths within you afresh today. Um, so if you'd like to do that, I invite you to do so now. But Paul, a former murderer, an opponent to the gospel, he meets Jesus and he surrenders his life to Jesus and he declares from prison after doing ministry that we are blessed with every spiritual blessing, that we are chosen, that in Jesus we have redemption through his blood, that we are blameless before him, that the riches of God's grace see us forgiven from our trespasses, that we who were dead in our sins have been made alive in Christ because of God's great mercy and love, that those of us who were once far off are now near, that we who were once separated from God but can now be reconciled to God through the cross, that the old law has been abolished, that in him we have obtained an inheritance, that we have been raised up in him and seated in the heavenly places with Jesus Christ, that Christ can dwell in our hearts through faith, that we are no longer strangers but are actually fellow citizens and saints in the straw in the household of God, that as his church we are his his body, that as his church we are being built together, that we are each God's workmanship and have been given gifts to build his church and his kingdom, that the love of Christ surpasses our knowledge, that he is able to do more abundantly than we can think of or imagine, that everything is in him and through him, and to him be the glory in the church through all the generations." You can keep standing if you'd like, but I invite you to sit. And in Revelation, and speaking these truths in the first three chapters of Ephesians, we then discussed two weeks ago how the second half of this book, chapters four to six, are essentially then about how we are called to live as saints and members of Christ as a result of those truths. How we are therefore that was the key word, therefore, how we are called to therefore, having received revelation of all of that, how we are called to live in a manner worthy of those truths and our calling, as Paul puts it. Therefore, he says, we are to put on the armor of the Lord in chapter 6. Therefore, he says, we are to be filled with the Spirit in chapter 5. Therefore, he says, we are to realize that we are one body, that we are to throw off our old selves and be renewed. Therefore, he says, we are to speak the truth to each other and love and build one another up. Therefore, he says, we are no longer to let corrupting talk come out of our mouths. We are, no longer, we are not to slander each other, as we talked about last time. And then, the final verse of chapter 4 says this. Be kind to one another, tender-hearted, forgiving one another, as God and Christ forgave you. And it is this topic of forgiveness that I want us to explore together today. Family, there is no doubt about it. Forgiveness is hard. When someone has hurt us, whether it be a close friend who is in our boat doing life with us, whether it be your spouse or someone in your connect group, or the wider church family, or the church leadership, past or present, or whether it be a parent or a sibling or a child or a family member, 
or a work colleague. When we hear what they've said about us and slander, or when they say something directly to us, or when we feel wronged in some way by this person that matters, it hurts. And we carry hurt with us. We simmer on it. And it impacts those relationships continually going forward. And I think that the closer we are to that person, the more hurt we are when things happen and the harder it is to forgive. Yet here in our Ephesians 4, Paul says, because we have received revelation of Christ in our own lives and of those truths that I have just read out, of what has been done for us, we, therefore, are to forgive one another as Christ forgave us. So with the rest of our time today, I want us to unpack this verse and this, instru uh, this instruction just a little bit. <laughs> Firstly, we shall chew on the first part of the verse and explore together what does it actually mean to forgive someone. And then we will transition into the second part of the verse and dwelling on this thought that we are to forgive as Christ has forgiven us. And we will be entering some different texts along the way. So, what does it mean to forgive someone? I think it is important to say from the outset that, in my opinion, there are some lies out there about forgiveness and what it means. For example... Someone might interpret it to mean that Christianity and this instruction uh, to forgive means that we are to continually endure and attempt to forget about some kind of ongoing emotional or physical abuse that we may be experiencing. Forgive and forget, we hear. I disagree with that rhetoric. I think that the Bible is very clear on pathways to reconciliation and that in Matthew, Jesus is clear that there does come a point where it is okay to distance yourself from someone who isn't listening and isn't repentant and continues to hurt you. This verse of forgiving one another as Christ forgave us is not a sentence to tolerating ongoing abuse. To explore then what it does mean for you, and for me, in our everyday lives, let's consider the original word used when writing this letter and its intended meaning. The New Testament was originally written in Greek. And thus, to get to grips with what Paul and Jesus meant when they talked about forgiveness, we have to find the original word and the intended meaning that they meant behind that word. So out from the backpack comes the concordance. And we discover that the original Greek word for forgive and forgiven was aphaemi, which means to let go, to lay aside, to pardon or release someone to let things go, to lay them aside, and to release people from the debt that they feel they owe us. Now, no props again today, sorry, folks. Um, but that's because I don't think we need them. There are some profound illustrations of people who have been wronged and who have been tasked with letting their offences go in the Bible, who we can be inspired by today. And one of my personal favourites is Philemon, whom we meet in another letter written by Paul. And if you have your Bibles with you, can I encourage you to join me in finding this very small New Testament letter. Um, I don't think that I have ever, ever heard a sermon that has unpacked this letter or even referenced it. Uh, there's a very strong chance that you may not have even ever read it. Um, but it is 
a beautiful illustration of forgiveness in action. And one of my favorite scholars, Tim Mackey, says that it is one of the most explosive things that Paul ever wrote. So if you have your Bibles, I'm reading from the ESV today. If you don't, it's okay. It's going to be on the screen. You can read along uh, with me. But from the ESV version, the letter of Philemon says, Paul, a prisoner for Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved fellow worker, and Aphia, our sister, and Acrobus, our fellow soldier, and the church in your house, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I thank my God always when I remember you in my prayers, because I hear of your love and of the faith that you have towards the Lord Jesus and for all of the saints. And I pray that the sharing of your faith may become effective for the full knowledge of every good thing that is in us for the sake of Christ. For I have derived much joy and comfort from your love, my brother, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed through you. Ephesians 4, building each other up in practice. Accordingly, though I am bold enough in Christ to command you to do what is required, yet for love's sake, I prefer to appeal to you. I, Paul, an old man, and now a prisoner also for Christ Jesus, I appeal to you for my child Onesimus, whose father I became in my imprisonment. Formerly, he was useless to you, but now he is indeed useful to you and to me. I am sending him back to you, sending my very heart. I would have been glad to keep him with me in order that he might serve me on your behalf during my imprisonment for the gospel. But I preferred to do nothing without your consent in order that your goodness might not be by compulsion, but of your own accord. For this, perhaps, is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother, especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. So if you consider me your partner, receive him, as you would receive me. If he has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. I, Paul, write this with my own hand. I will repay it. To say nothing of your owing me, even your own self. Yes, brother, I want some benefit from you and the Lord. Refresh my heart in Christ. Confident of your obedience, I write to you, knowing that you will do even more than I say. At the same time, prepare a guest room for me, for I am hoping that through your prayers, I will be graciously given to you. Ephorus, my fellow prisoner for Christ Jesus, sends greeting to you, and so does Mark, and Aram, and Demaeus, and Luke, my fellow workers. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you in spirit. So, some context for this letter. Philemon, the recipient of this letter, is believed by scholars to have been a prosperous Roman citizen in Colossae, who likely met Paul when Paul was doing ministry in Ephesus. Philemon became a follower of Jesus through Paul's ministry and later became a leader in a church that met in his house. Now, as was the custom at the time, Philemon, as a wealthy Roman citizen, he owned slaves, one of which was Onesimus. Now, at some point, Onesimus and Philemon have a serious conflict. And Onesimus, the slave, wrongs his master Philemon in some way. We don't know exactly what Onesimus did, but it is widely believed that he potentially stole something or cheated Philemon in some way. 
And consequently, Onesimus flees Philemon's house and runs away. And then divinely, Onesimus meets Paul while Paul is doing one of his stints in detention. And Onesimus becomes a follower of Jesus. Not only that, but the letter implies that Paul and Onesimus become close. Paul calls Onesimus his child, his very heart, and says that he has been useful in his ministry. So Paul, who now knows both of these followers of Jesus and knows that there has been conflict between the two of them, is in an interesting position. Paul could have kept Onesimus with him and had his help and ministry going forward once he got out of detention. And at the time, uh, according to one of my commentaries, uh, provincial officers hunted runaway slaves uh, with the sole intention of capturing them and taking them back to their masters for discipline um, and the consequences of their actions. Indeed, the letter says that Paul would have been very glad to keep Onesimus with him. And I'm sure that Onesimus would have been desperate to stay free and to stay with Paul, or at the very least be sent to one of Paul's other networks and one of his other ministries elsewhere. But instead, this letter is Paul's response and his action. He personally writes this letter to Philemon, and he tells Onesimus to return to Philemon, his former master, whom he has wronged, who will decide his fate. And this action from Paul in this letter highlights how important Paul thinks dealing with stuff and forgiving one another is in the body of Christ. He doesn't choose the easy option, nor the one that benefited him. Instead, he chooses the hardest option for everybody, and he chooses what he thinks is best for the body of Christ by intentionally facilitating reconciliation. And we should take note of that. We are to choose the hard option, to forgive and to seek reconciliation as well. And I look forward to meeting Philemon one day. I look forward to running my race and graduating and passing my what have you done with what I gave you, questioning, and then getting to my heavenly hut and having a lovely cup of heavenly made tea and chocolate biscuit and inviting Philemon over and talking about how his earthly self felt receiving this hand letter, handwritten letter from his brother and his mentor, Paul. Philemon had been wronged by Onesimus, the slave who had run away and who was now on his way back to his property. And if scholars are correct in their assumptions that Onesimus did steal something or cheated him in some way, Philemon was likely not just to be physically without things, but he had every reason to feel like he was owed something. Owed penance by this ungrateful slave. And importantly, society norms of the day also put the power of punishment and justice completely in Philemon's hands. Slaves were completely at the mercy of their masters for everything, including disciplinary action. And one of my commentaries says, It was a master's right to discipline Onesimus as an offensive slave say, by seeking to have him scourged or branded or even crucified if a runaway, which Onesimus was, or by denying him any further hope for eventual freedom if a troublemaker. Indeed, some discipline would have seemed imperative as a lesson to like-minded slaves. One had to maintain discipline. And essentially... Philemon had unquestionably been wronged. And like Philemon, you may also have been wronged by someone. 
your own Onesimuses, if you will. Someone who has hurt you or wronged you. For example, and these are just examples, you may have been hurt by gossip. That is simply not true. That has been spread about you in re recently or in years past. Others may have said harshful or hurtful things to you directly and offended you deeply. Someone may have treated you unfairly or harshly through action. Or they've disappointed you by not behaving as you think they should. Our boss may have treated us unfairly. Our parents may have treated us poorly. Someone may have hurt your kids or your family members or your loved ones. Our friends may screw up and hurt us. And the chances are high, I think, that we have each been wronged at some point or another. And our very natural and human response is to hold on to these things and to let them shape our perception and ongoing relationship with that person. Philemon had a right to see and wait for justice as he, as he saw fit. And we're the same. Well, I am anyway. But when someone hurts me, there are certain things that I expect to be done to make it up to me. A repayment or a, not a punishment, but, you know, a making amends of sort. But no, 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 according to Paul. Despite how unnatural it feels to do so, as Jesus followers, we are, by the very definition of the word forgiveness, to let our offenses go. We, like Philemon, are urged to walk in a, manner, in a manner worthy of our calling and to consequently lay our offenses aside and release those who have hurt us from the debt that they feel they owe us. Are you all still with me? Philemon receives this letter from Paul, the person who introduced him to Jesus, telling him to let go, to lay aside and release Onesimus, a thieving slave from his offenses. But Paul also does more than that. He encourages Philemon to not just let Onesimus back onto the property to resume his duties as a slave, punishment-free, which we could maybe have wrapped our heads around, but to rather accept him as an equal and as a brother in Christ, as a family member. The letter says, For this perhaps is why he was parted from you for a while, that you might have him back forever, no longer as a bondservant, but more than a bondservant, as a beloved brother. <laughs> Especially to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord? This is major stuff. This is unheard of and deeply contradictory to our natural human response. And the Roman status quo and society norms of the day of Philemon and of our society today as well. This is a new order, completely different and contrary to the earthly system of justice. But here's the thing. Philemon and us, we are not called to live by the earthly standard. We are called to partner with each other as equals, as brothers and sisters and children of Christ. United in our revelation of the truths in chapters 1 to 3 and our grace and love that we have all received through Christ. Hmm. So when this letter arrived then, and as he saw Onesimus in the distance walking back onto his property, 
Philemon faced a choice. Would he pursue the earthly justice that he was rightfully owed? Or would he instead choose to see this runaway slave as a brother and fellow follower of Jesus, whom he would release from the debt that was owing? Now, the fact that this letter was circulated and included in the, in the canon um, of literature that we read leads scholars to believe that Philemon indeed did receive Onesimus as a brother when he arrived. And the fact that this letter was circulated through the churches highlights the importance of forgiveness and reconciliation in the body of Christ. And the reality is, my family that we all face the same choice as Philemon did. We are privileged to be able to read the same letter he received and all the other scripture where the theme of forgiving one another is constantly woven through. We have met the same God, we live in the same calling, and we therefore face the continual choice as to whether we now will lay aside and release those brothers and sisters who have, re- who have hurt us. When we metaphorically have Onesimus equivalents in our lives, people who have wronged us, and we get to read the same letter, we make the same choice. And when we face this choice, as we inevitably will, it is important to remember something. Paul hints at it in his letter when he tells Philemon, if Onesimus has wronged you at all or owes you anything, charge that to my account. And at this point, our Christian brain sirens should be going off in our head with the reminder of where else in the Bible the debt of the person in the wrong has been paid for in full by someone else. Which brings me to the second point of today. The reason that forgiveness of this extraordinary, unearthly, unnatural nature in Philemon's context and in ours, and the reason that we are similarly called to let go and to release others from their failures is because Christ has laid aside ours. Our wrongs have been laid aside by the one who's released us from a debt that we could otherwise not repay. Our motivation for laying aside the hurt and the wrongs that have been done to us is the constant reflection and meditation of the fact that Christ has released us from our sins. He has paid our unpayable debt in full. He keeps no record of our wrongs. We have been released. We have been forgiven. And in Matthew 18, Jesus speaks to this very reality reality in a very blunt parable about the unforgiving servant. And if you have your Bibles out, I encourage you to move from Philemon um, back to the left of the New Testament, and join me in Matthew 18, which reads, in verse 21, sorry. Then Peter came up and said to him, Lord, how often will my brother sin against me and I forgive him? As many as seven times. How earthly and human is that? And Jesus said to him, I do not say to you seven times, but 77. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who wished to settle accounts with his servants. When he began to settle, one was brought to him who owed him 10,000 talents. And since he could not pay, his master ordered him to be sold with his wife and with his children and all that he had. 
and payment was to be made. So the servant fell on his knees, imploring him, have patience with me, and I will pay you everything. And out of pity for him, the master of that servant released him and forgave him the debt. Whoa. But when the same servant went out, he found one of his fellow servants who owed him a couple of hundred denarii. And seizing him, he began to choke him, saying, pay me what you owe. So his fellow servant fell down and pleaded with him, have patience with me and I will pay you. He refused and he went and put him in prison until he should pay the debt. When his fellow servants saw what had taken place, they were greatly distressed. And they went and they reported to their master all that had happened. Then his master summoned him and said to him, You wicked servant. I forgave you all that debt because you pleaded with me. And should you not have had mercy on your fellow servant as I had mercy on you? And in anger, his master delivered him to the jailers until he should pay all his debt. So also, my heavenly Father will do to every one of you if you do not forgive your brother from your heart. And what's interesting to me is that Jesus used parables throughout his ministry uh, to tell people about the kingdom of God. Each parable is like a riddle and a puzzle. And Jesus says that those who have ears to hear and eyes to see will be able to interpret and reflect on what it is that he's saying through the parables. But this one, this one, in my opinion, is pretty direct. And it's clear right from the outset what listeners are supposed to take away from it. Those in the kingdom of God are under a new justice system. We are not called to be like the servant who was released from a significant and unpayable debt of 10,000 talents by a kind and merciful master to then turn around to demand the full small few hundred denarii by someone else. This chapter 18 was spoken by Jesus before his death on the cross, and in it he is saying that his kingdom is here. That a radical change to how we see justice is coming, that a master is coming to settle the significant and unpayable debts for servants in the past, the present, and the future. And then in nine chapters, that is exactly what happens. Despite living a perfect life, and therefore owing no one nothing. Jesus is betrayed by one of his friends. He is condemned by the very humanity he created and who are actually the ones in debt. He is whipped. He is stripped. The nails are smashed through his hands that have never done any wrong. And he hangs naked and publicly on a hill he is taunted and he is challenged as he dies. And he does all of this because of our wrongdoing and our debt. Because we have fallen short. Because like the parable says, our debt is greater than anything that we could ever pay back. He utters as he grasps for breath, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's like he's saying, Father, forgive every child of yours in the past whose actions have created the debt and consequent need for me to hang here today. They know not what they do. Release them. Father, forgive the children who condemned me today and who now stand at the foot of my cross taunting me to come down. They know not what they do. Release them. Father, forgive Anna Button, born in 1992 in Rangura, New Zealand. Release her from the future debt that she's going to accumulate rapidly. 
and that she will be unable to repay. Lay all of her sin and wrongdoing aside once and for all. Father, forgive every member of St. Albans Baptist Church 2022 and all the global members of my body. Release them from all of their future debts as individuals and as a collective, that they will accumulate rapidly and will never be able to repay. Lay all of their sin and wrongdoing aside once and for all. Release them from the debt. And now as people who have encountered Jesus, and who have received revelation of the fact that our unpayable and significant debts have been paid for on the cross, and we've received revelation of the truths in the first three chapters, we therefore are now called to forgive those who hurt us, to release and to lay aside any debts owing to us. Family, we are, well, I think, I think, that we like to dwell on the fact that we ourselves have been forgiven. But perhaps we struggle more with the reality that the person or the people who have wronged us have also been forgiven by the same blood of Christ Jesus that was poured out for us. But he has. It wasn't just poured out for you. It was poured out for everybody. And it has released you from a debt far greater than anything a fellow brother or sister could owe you. So to close today, and as the band come up, um, I want us to all imagine both the, position, the positions of Onesimus and the position of Philemon. Paul highlights the importance of reconciliation, and he sends Onesimus back to his master who he has wronged. Now, Onesimus, as I said earlier, would not have wanted to do this. <laughs> Ain't no way he wants to go back to the master he's wronged. His fate would have been placed entirely in the hands of the master he has wronged, whereas if he stayed with Paul or had gone elsewhere, he could quite happily have remained free, probably. He would, not have had to have faced, he would not have had to face up to what he had done or the consequences of it. He would have been very tempted, I think, to have left Paul saying he was on the road to Philemon's house and then taken a tiki to her. And yet he goes, he arrives, and he plays his part in reconciliation and facing up to his wrongs. And I think that there is something in that for all of us, this instruction to forgive as Christ has forgiven us is not a get-out-of-jail-free card for those of us who have hurt others and know we have. If we know we have hurt someone, we should seek reconciliation and ask for forgiveness. And this is hard, and not many people do it, because it's hard, and it's humbling, and actually admitting that, you're doing, that you've done something wrong is against our human nature as well. <laughs> but God calls us to be reconciled. So can I encourage you this morning, if you know you've made a mistake, to go up to the person that you've wronged and humbly apologize. And then if we consider Philemon's position, Sometimes people forget that they've even said stuff. They may not know that they've hurt or offended you. Or there's just absolutely no way that they have the capacity to ask for forgiveness. And irrespective of whether someone asks for it or not, we are still called to take instruction from Paul and inspiration from Philemon. Here was a man who had been wronged, who deserved justice, who had every argument and every earthly law on his side, telling him that he was worthy of payment. And yet history would tell us that he heeded Paul's request and instruction to release Onesimus from his debt. God knows that forgiveness is hard. He knows it feels unnatural. He knows and sees us when we are hurting. He sees us as the words spoken about us or our loved ones sting our heart. He sees us as we cry 
or as we stir at night, or as we ruminate in the car. He sees us as we take those offenses and we carry them like a weight. And we carry the pain and the disappointment. And he sees us as like Philemon. We receive this instruction to forgive. And we're like, how? (laughs) And I believe that he invites us to ask him to help us. Forgiving and releasing someone is a decision, and it's a daily one from our hearts. And it's one that I think God will help us with as we take comfort and strength from the fact that he will help us. So as the band play, can I encourage you that if as I've been speaking, if as I've been speaking, the Spirit's been stirring and things have been coming up in in your brain, (laughs) of wrongs or times where you've been hurt, either by someone in the body or someone outside the body, where you know that there's hurt that you've been carrying or unforgiveness that you've been carrying, can I invite you to make this morning the time where you deal with it? And where you make the decision, like Philemon, to receive this letter and to make a choice that actually today I'm going to release someone from the debt. I'm not going to carry it anymore. I'm going to release them. So if that's you if, you, if you would like to ask God to help you with that, if you'd like to have prayer um, as you go about just that, that physical process of coming forward and saying to God, yes, I want your help. Yes, I want to release this out of my life. I want to leave today freer, having laid some stuff aside. Can I invite you to come down the front? I'd love to pray with you. The prayer team would love to pray, to pray with you. But do some work. Don't leave with the same heaviness or the same weight or the same unforgiveness carrying with you. Therefore, we are called to live in a manner worthy of our calling.